Welcome back to the lab. You know, have you ever wondered about how to find a way that doesn't make your transistors blow up? Well, you're in luck because today we're talking about MOSFETs and I'm going to show you exactly how we do it. Right then, let's start from the basics. I need to know that we're all on the same page. If I lose you, let me know in the comments and we'll do a dedicated video that follows up and gives a little more detail. But a MOSFET is a voltage controlled transistor and we're going to be using a MOSFET as a voltage controlled switch. When a voltage is applied at the gate such that it should turn on, current is allowed to pass through it. One key advantage of a MOSFET over a BJT is that the output current does not depend on the control current. That is, the steady state control current of a MOSFET is always zero, zero amps, but current is allowed to flow from drain to source. A MOSFET is most accurately modeled as a voltage controlled resistance. Since we're using our MOSFET as a switch, we'd prefer the on state resistance or RDS on to be as small as possible. Applying a larger voltage to the gate of a transistor reduces the resistance and therefore it's a little more efficient when being used as a switch. There are many ways to use a MOSFET to solve a problem in modern day electronics. You'll find MOSFETs used in everything from power supplies to memory chips with a multitude of voltage and current ratings ranging from volts to thousands of volts. We could talk about the physics behind applications of and trade-offs between competing technologies for quite a while, but I'd probably get a little too excited and start rambling on for hours. While fun, that isn't exactly what I'm trying to get across today. Our discussion isn't necessarily about how MOSFETs work or how different technologies compare to one another, though all of that is quite important. We're coming from a different angle here. If you're pretty sure that you want to use a MOSFET, but you're struggling to find exactly the right one, then buckle up and plug in because by the end of this video, I'm betting that you will be better prepared to make this critical part selection decision. There are a few limits of MOSFETs that are hard limits, lines that should never be crossed, at least if you value the continued existence of your circuit. These include the gate to source voltage rating, the drain to source voltage rating, and the safe operating area of the part. The gate source voltage rating is a reflection of how much voltage can be safely applied while turning on the transistor before it breaks. If this limit is exceeded, MOSFETs typically fail short circuit. That is, a MOSFET will typically behave like it's permanently stuck on after this limit is exceeded. Likewise, the drain source voltage rating. This rating tells us how much voltage a transistor can hold back before something gives out internally, opening the floodgate, so to speak. Exceeding the drain to source voltage rating also tends to make a MOSFET fail short or be stuck on. The safe operating area is a bit more difficult to describe. This rating describes how much power a MOSFET can absorb for a brief moment in time. And it's a very important limit because MOSFETs used as a switch typically get exposed to this type of stress a lot. They'll typically gulp a few hundred watts for a very short time. And that pulse of power is observed while transitioning from off on or vice versa. That's because there's some time when there's both voltage across and current through any transistor. Violating the safe operating area of a part during this transition, so dissipating too much power or dissipating an allowable amount of power for too long, typically causes a MOSFET to fail open or to be stuck off. Now it's possible that I'm underselling this failure a little bit here because when I say fail open, while accurate, that doesn't quite describe how violently it can happen. When a FET fails due to violating its safe operating area, that transistor typically blows itself apart. That's what happened to these sad little FETs from our first inverter prototype. Those parts literally sounded like somebody lit a firecracker in my lab. My ears were ringing. It was awesome. Yeah. These ratings, drain to source voltage, gate to source voltage, and safe operating area, those are what you can think of as absolutely never, ever, not even for a nanosecond exceed this rating sort of limits. But there are some softer requirements too. Gate drive, power dissipation, and rate of rise, or DVDT, are all things that we need to be thinking about. Gate drive and the change in voltage per time, or DVDT, go hand in hand. Typically, I'm using a MOSFET for a switching application, and this means that the most ideal case would be transitioning from off to on as quickly as possible. This minimizes the power dissipated while switching, and it helps to ensure that the safe operating area isn't exceeded. Those are both great things. Those are excellent things that we should be keeping in mind whenever optimizing a MOSFET, but there's more at play here. 
If you're using a MOSFET and an H bridge as a high side and a low side pair, like a synchronous buck or full bridge, then we need to consider the DVDT rating or the change in voltage per time rating for a part. Here's the issue. There is a small, but present, parasitic capacitor across the drain of our MOSFET to the gate. This is a fundamental part of how these transistors are made. There's just nothing we can do about it. It's there. It's always there. We can add extra capacitance, but we can never take that minimum quantity of capacitance away. So let's imagine what might happen if we try to raise the drain voltage of this transistor very quickly. That capacitor would be asked to charge, but it would tend to just drag the gate voltage of the transistor up. If the gate driver isn't strong enough to provide the current required to charge that capacitor, or if the gate driver resistor is too large, this capacitor will actually generate a voltage that can turn on the part the same way that the bootstrap cap on a high side gate driver works. That might sound bad, but we haven't even gotten to the messy part yet. Remember what just caused this. We turned down the upper MOSFET, which applied a rapidly increasing voltage on the bottom FET. Think about that. The upper switch just turned on, and turning that on too quickly caused the lower FET to turn on at the same time. Now both transistors are on, and that's literally the definition of shoot through. As a reminder, if both switches are on, that means that we're shorting our four series light acid batteries through these transistors. Given that these batteries can provide currents in excess of 800 amps for up to 30 seconds, I think it's safe to say that we will likely violate the safe operating area of the parts, which means it will probably see a short flash followed by a loud bang. Basically, gate drive is ideally very strong so that we turn our transistors on fast, while also making sure that they stay off when we want them to be off. Another approach can be driving a transistor on more slowly than it's driven off. Gate drive that is very slow prevents unintended turn on of our MOSFETs by removing the rapid change in voltage altogether, but it's not necessarily the best solution because it's lossy. We're going to burn a lot of power during that slow transition. Thankfully, we can always implement asymmetrical gate drive to make sure that we're holding the MOSFET off as hard as we can, but slowing down the on transition just a little bit. Try to hit that middle ground where we're not excessively lossy, but we're not creating excessive DVDT either. We have some conflicting requirements here, but I see a solution. If we add a small capacitor between the gate and drain, that will cause the gate driver to dissipate a bit more power because it has to charge and discharge that extra load, but it will establish a capacitive voltage divider that will limit the peak voltage possible to generate on this transistor gate. Thankfully, we don't need much capacitance here to get the job done. The parasitic capacitance is actually pretty small, so that adding a few nanofarads of capacitance between the gate and drain of this transistor can help the situation a lot. Current will be shared between the capacitor and the gate of the transistor and the gate driver, so we need to make sure that the gate driver is still capable of adequately driving the system to prevent the current from going into the transistor and turning it on. We've just increased the peak current required. Power is also something to think about because we're charging and discharging this capacitor once every switching cycle like I just alluded to. That adds up fast. Multiplying even a little bit of energy by 200,000 cycles per second translates into a not so little bit of energy. I feel like I just glossed over a point. We mentioned that, that we want to drive the MOSFET harder in one direction than the other, and we're going to accomplish this with a diode and two resistors. Through implementing a simple resistor in one direction and a diode resistor combo in the other, asymmetrical gate drive is possible. We're effectively creating a resistor whose value changes based on which direction current is flowing, providing just that little bit of extra kick that we'll need to ensure our transistor stays off when required. By the way, don't be misled by datasheets. I find that datasheets for MOSFETs can be a little misleading, especially for the vol change in voltage per time rating. Parts can be rated for 50 to 300 volts per nanosecond, maximum rate of rise, which is an insane slope, but that assumes a particular gate drive circuit. If your gate driver is different, your effective maximum rate of rise is likely different and probably worse. For example, the part that we're using is rated for 50 volts per nanosecond, which is pretty extreme. Measuring this in spice from applying around 200 volts per microsecond, and the transistor is actually just barely turning on. We're right on the edge of turning on. My stress is two orders of magnitude smaller than the rating in the data sheet, and we're almost on. So clearly the data sheet was making some assumptions that do not align with our application. That was kind of a twofer. One topic left now. Power. There are three different kinds of power ratings that need to be considered. 
there's an absolute maximum power limit, which is an absolute threshold that no matter how long the power is applied, it will damage the transistor. There's also a softer safe operating area limit, and this tells us the peak current that can be absorbed for a specific length of time without causing an issue. To be clear, power dissipation isn't always a concern. The power dissipated in a signal FET is typically so small that it can just be ignored. That's not the case for power transistors. For transistors that are being used to switch power, there are two primary ways the power dissipation manifests. Power dissipation in transistors due to switching losses and conduction losses. Switching losses look a lot like that safe operating area type of stress. There's a lot of power absorbed for a very short time and it happens periodically, typically twice every switching cycle. Once while transitioning from off to on and once while transitioning from on to off. If we have made a reasonable gate drive circuit, the quantity of power dissipated in each transition is approximately constant. A way that this ties into selecting a particular switching frequency is this. If the power dissipated in each transition is approximately constant, this means that losses will increase approximately proportionally with switching frequency. If power is dissipated 200,000 times a second instead of 100,000, switching losses should double. There are some lesser factors that contribute to switching losses in MOSFETs, but an analysis like this can turn into a rabbit hole quickly. If I'm doing this calculation by hand, I typically add enough margin in my switching loss calculations that everything works out about right. I can add margin to my calculation of switching losses to compensate for neglecting some more complex loss mechanisms. It's not a perfect system, but time is short, and I've found that this is accurate enough for most situations. Speaking of calculating, it's not too difficult to estimate power burn in one switching cycle. Let's say that a transistor is transitioning from off to on. The on state current, let's say 10 amps, and the off state voltage is 50 volts. We could, for example, assume a linear voltage slope from 50 down to zero and a linear current slope from zero up to 10. This finds that the peak power should be where these two lines overlap. So that would be five amps and 25 volts or a peak power of around 125 watts. If we just assume that this transition is occurring over the course of 0.1 microseconds, then we could make a horribly inaccurate but conservative assumption that this 125 watts is dissipated for that entire transition time. This would mean that 125 watts would be dissipated for 0.1 microseconds. If the switching period is 200 kilohertz, like it is in our full bridge converter in the UPS project, one switching cycle lasts for five microseconds. We need to spread this peak power into an effective average power for future calculations. I know that this part will transition from off to on back to off in one switching cycle, which tells us that we'll be spending 0.2 microseconds burning 125 watts. If we can assume, just for now, that we're dissipating zero watts for the rest of the switching cycle, the average power would be 125 watts multiplied by 0.2 divided by five. Hmm, man, that 125 watts came down to a pretty reasonable five five watts of average power burned due to switching losses. Now, if I truly expected five watts to be lost in switching, I'd likely recommend the transistors be turned on faster to get the loss down or switched at a lower switching frequency. But this is only an example, so that's switching loss. We need to make sure that the part can handle 125 watts for 0.1 microseconds by inspecting the safe operating area curve. We should also verify that the part can handle five watts of average power without getting too hot, but wait a minute, the average power isn't only five watts, we're forgetting something. Conduction losses, remember this is a voltage controlled resistor, and that means conduction losses are another potentially huge loss factor, and it's a bit easier to calculate. Once on, that MOSFET's behaving like a resistor, so we're calculating I squared R, or simple resistive losses. These aren't computationally difficult, but the critical step is accurately determining what the resistor value is. This resistance depends on the gate drive voltage, temperature of the part, and the component itself. Determining series resistance of a FET can feel a bit like hitting a moving target. I typically calculate the resistance at a lower gate drive voltage and a maximum junction temperature for the part. That is when the resistance will have its largest value. So let's say that our resistance is 100 milliohms for our transistor, or 0.1 ohms. With a 0.1 ohm resistor, we now need to use the maximum duty cycle to know how long current may be flowing through this part. In our application, the maximum duty cycle is 90%, but let's just say 100% because that would be worse. The calculation is current squared multiplied by the resistance of the part multiplied by the duty cycle. For our example, that's 10 times 10 multiplied by 0.1 multiplied by one or 10 watts. 
We then combine the switching and conduction losses to know that 15 watts of power is expected to be dissipated in this example transistor at this temperature with a particular level of gate drive at this frequency in this application. It's not a perfect model, and there were a lot of assumptions, but I'm just looking for a, is this going to work or not, thumbs up, thumbs down type of result. I don't need an accurate number. If I need a higher degree of accuracy, that's when I'll break out a manufactured device model and a circuit simulation tool of some sort. My approximation will land in the ballpark. It'll be in the rough order of magnitude, but I wouldn't go so far to call it accurate. We're talking about, like I said, a rough order of magnitude, and naturally, there are some modifications to this process that can get thrown in to increase accuracy, 11 herbs and spices, so to speak. That said, time is short, and we have more to talk about. Let's say, for example, that you're working in an application where you're pushing transistors pretty hard. A great example is that power supply we mentioned briefly. Our transistors are switching up to 58 volts and up to 100 amps. That is not a small task. In fact, that's pretty challenging. After running through some calculations and simulations, I found that the switching losses were pretty small, but the ohmic, conduction, or resistive losses were pretty significant. Here's what I did. I put two of these transistors in parallel. Why? Putting two MOSFETs in parallel cuts the effective resistance, or ESR, of these parts in half at a price. Putting two MOSFETs in parallel means that we either need a stronger gate driver or two gate drivers, and it's critical that two separate gate drive networks are used. A gate driver can be shared between multiple parts if it has enough supply current, but the gate drive resistor absolutely cannot. Well, should not. Well, it depends. If two MOSFETs are driven to the same resistor, then current will be shared between the two unequally. The peak current will be limited by the gate drive resistor, but how much current is going into either transistor depends heavily on how much gate capacitance each of them has. Gate drive current will not be shared equally, which means that one part will consistently turn on faster than the other, whichever has less capacitance. That also means that we'll be fighting twice as much current through our gate drive resistor while we're turning on our FETs, and we'll be fighting twice as much current while trying to hold them off in a half bridge configuration. All of those checks we were just talking about, sharing a gate drive resistor between two parts make the peak stresses and peak currents more difficult to calculate accurately, which means that losses in either transistor becomes more difficult to calculate accurately. Using two separate gate drive networks eliminates many of the issues here. Two separate networks will limit the peak current in either transistor individually, and we can be certain that they will both turn on at approximately the same time. If the gate driver can supply enough current to supply both transistors, we're done. If not, use two separate gate drivers. So how can we know if two drivers are required? Well, if we assume that there's zero volts at the gate of the transistor, the peak current will be equal to the maximum gate drive voltage divided by the gate drive resistor. Simple Ohm's law. Multiply that by the number of gates you're driving, and it's easy to calculate when a second gate driver is required. Whoa, that was a lot. But I think that we shared a lot of great information. Let's tie this together. We talked about using MOSFETs in parallel to reduce losses, limits of MOSFETs, and how to calculate power dissipation. We talked about some common ways to destroy MOSFETs. We didn't quite get to talking about thermal management for MOSFETs, but we certainly can. Let us know if that's something that you're interested in. I'm really glad that we took the time to do this analysis and set our battery module in a path for success. If you like what you saw today, consider subscribing to be notified of our future videos. We'll be showing how to size capacitance for a DC link and design another custom transformer for a switch mode power supply. This time, it's 13 to 1 full bridge, and man, this one is a real challenge. If you'd like to support the channel, consider checking out the products that we featured through our Amazon affiliate links in the video description. It really helps us out a lot. I think that MOSFETs are great. If you picked up a couple new tricks today, let me know by hitting the like button on this video, finding us on Twitter, or leaving a comment letting us know what you enjoyed. Most of all, I hope that you learned something great today, and I hope to see you again soon. Thanks for watching EE for everyone, and thanks for staying till the end. Bye.